Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to take one more minute as as participants start to to fill in here, and uh, we'll get started. So just bear with us for for just a minute as uh, uh, all the participants continue to kind of filter in. Well, I think we will go ahead to, and get started to keep everything on, on time today. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on, on where you are. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, today's webinar is on carcass management, pathways to implementation. It is the final and, and third part of a series that we have been doing. Uh, I believe today we have a truly excellent panel uh, from which you'll hear from landowners, city staff, uh, NGOs, and researchers who are currently using some style of carcass management to minimize interactions and prevent depredation events between livestock and large predators, such as wolves and grizzly bears. But before we get into our, our panel discussion today, we have a few introductions and, and information to share. Um, I'm Jared Beaver, uh, Assistant Professor and Extension Wildlife Specialist at Montana State University. My duties are, are split between extension and, and research. And really the, the mission for extension is to provide the lives of citizens unbiased and research-based information that helps integrate learning and engagement, uh, primarily to strengthen the social, economic, and environmental well-being of individuals, families, and communities. And so given that and my wildlife background, I find myself very involved with wildlife livestock conflict mitigation within my programs. Uh, but MSU Extension and myself is just one of the many partners uh, on this project team that we call Conflict on Working Lands Conservation Innovation Grant. That's CALSIG for short. Uh, it's comprised of a lot of different entities. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper on an introduction into this project in a moment. But I would like to acknowledge that um, this project, the Conservation Innovation Grant, is funded from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS. And so a huge thank you to them. They have been a tremendous partner on this project so far. And on behalf of our team, we just want to take a moment to acknowledge that and say thank you uh, for all the work and support that you've been doing with us. Um, and so, you know, with that, um, th this project really, as we move forward today, uh, this particular uh, webinar is going to be on carcass management. Um, and it's going to involve and look at, you know, ranchers and NRCF staff on producer implemented techniques uh, for mitigating wildlife livestock conflict and uh, production risk caused by large carnivores uh, on the landscape. And that's what this particular uh, webinar is on, carcass management. We did have two others in this particular series, uh, one on range riding and one on fencing and flattery. And you'll be able to view those recordings if you miss them. Uh, those will be popped into the chat. I will try and do that on my end um, here. Let's see, hopefully those work. So if you did miss um, any of the, the first two parts of this series, those can be viewed there. And right now, I would like to take a moment to introduce uh, another one of our, our Cal SIG team members, Alex Few the Working Wild Challenge Coordinator for Western Landowners Alliance and, and just a, a tremendous partner on my behalf. And Alex is gonna take a moment to talk about the four C's framework around conflict reduction. Thanks, Jared. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna take a minute to introduce those of you who are not familiar with Western Landowners Alliance to our organization. 
So Western Landowners Alliance is a West-wide organization whose mission is to advance policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. And the Working Wild Challenge program within WLA is specifically designed to help ranchers meet the challenges of wildlife on working land. So um, we talked a lot about carcass management in this program and, and even, you know, for for many of the partners on this project for, for years before there was a Working Wild Challenge program. So um, carcass management really can mean a lot of different things, whether it's working with range conservationists on national force to remove carcasses in areas that are accessible by road, whether it's taking carcasses to a local landfill or transferring carcasses to a community composting site. And today we're really gonna focus on managing carcasses on private lands, keeping in mind that carcass management is just one conflict prevention tool. Jared mentioned the other two that are part of this conflict on working lands, conservation and invasion grant, range riding and fencing. And really all of these are types of wildlife conflict prevention techniques that are often called non-lethal tools. And our project partners recognize that conflict prevention, these non-lethal practices, are just one part of a framework for conflict reduction that we call the four C's. So um, the four C's are compensation, conflict prevention, like the practices we're talking about today, control, meaning lethal control, and collaboration. And we really see this as a conflict reduction framework that supports conservation and provides opportunities to address the social, ecological, and economic situations that are unique to each region, each community, each operation within a landscape shared by people and wildlife. So I'll just quickly review um, what each of these four C's really is about. So compensation needs to be equitable with widely valued wildlife like wolves and grizzly bears. The cost of providing habitat for these highly mobile species should be shared by society. Conflict prevention tools are designed to deter wildlife and funding and support for these tools is needed to give producers the time and the resources to find what works within their individual operations and landscapes. Lethal control is a critical tool that supports conflict prevention and does not undermine it. So solutions for conflicts with wildlife on working lands require that all tools are in the toolbox. And lastly, collaboration is key. Solutions go nowhere when the people who must implement them are left out of the planning. So we all really appreciate you all for being here today and being part of that solution. So, you know, we believe that this integrated approach, the four C's leaves room to adapt solutions again to what are social, economic and ecological conditions unique to each community in the West. And that ultimately, this will provide for better connected landscapes that sustain the culture of the West, make our ranches more resilient, and, and support the people and the wildlife that are iconic in the West. So I'm gonna pass it back to Jared for a minute here, and, and we'll just keep passing back and forth between the two of us for a little while. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for that overview, uh, Alex. And again, this entire webinar series, all three components is work that is being done as part of what we call ourselves the Cal SIG, the Conflict on Working Lands, part of this SIG project. So before we move on, I would just like to take uh, an opportunity to provide a brief overview of the project and the team. And often the biggest problem landowners, natural resource practitioners are faced with is how to balance the needs of both people and wildlife. And that's a large part of the basis of this project and this team. We believe the best way to do that is through collaborative knowledge exchanges, transparent participatory research, and ultimately partnerships that foster trust. Uh, another component we believe that's key to success in this arena is also finding ways to reduce the financial cost of simply sharing working lands because minimizing wildlife livestock conflicts, and in this case, predator livestock conflicts, is essential to both wildlife conservation and ag production. And 
uh, those win-wins are, are really what we're looking for. And our current project supported by, again, uh, SIG from NRCS is to study these three techniques that we've had a webinar series on. Fencing, flattery scenarios, range riding, uh, carcass management, and, and that's the focal point today. These three practices are, are being implemented and refined by a land steward network spanning seven Western states. Uh, this research is ongoing to understand kind of how and where to implement these three practices in order to best support habitat use by wildlife while decreasing predator conflict with livestock. Our project team uh, is, again, it, it has a lot of different stakeholders, Heart of the Rockies Initiative, Western Landowners Alliance, uh, MSU Extension, Utah State, Colorado State, you know, USDA, and, and others. And, and really the, the stakeholders involved from amongst these various organizations cover a broad spectrum, including wildlife researchers, extension personnel such as myself, and, and landowners. And that's because Ultimately, our vision for this project is, as Alex mentioned, cultivate resilient ranches, healthy rural communities, and ultimately connected landscapes. And as a team, we feel that involves three key focal areas uh, to be able to better refine conflict mitigation strategies, uh, to develop sustained financial and technical assistance for implementing these mitigation techniques, and then lastly, to create stronger partnerships for a more efficient delivery of timely information and knowledge exchange opportunities. And, you know, that's one of the advantages of events such as this one. We believe events like today really help us push the needle forward uh, for all three of these. And so um, that's that's just kind of a, a grounding base on our project and our team and where we're coming from. And, and kind of the emphasis behind some of these webinars today. And um, with that, before we jump in to our panel, the, the kind of the last thing um, uh, we'll hear from, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Alex, who's filling in for Bree Owens, uh, who unfortunately is unable to join us today. Uh, so Alex will be stepping in to talk about risk assessment framework and kind of a, a landscape stratification um, that can be used as a planning tool as we think about cost sharing around some of these mitigation tools. So with that, I'll turn it, I'll turn it over to you, Alex. Thanks, Jared. And, and I just appreciate everybody's patience as I navigate through Bree's presentation in our world of, you know, um, health, new health issues. We've, we've got to be patient with everybody stepping in for others at different times. So, um, what I'm going to present today is a framework for risk assessment and practice evaluation. So if you think of risk assessment as an inventory of the situation, um, it's really like a site specific tool for an operation that can be used to determine what strategies or practices make sense for that specific operation. But before I get into this framework for risk assessment, um, and, and practice evaluation, I want to take a step back and touch on something Jared mentioned around the CalSIG. So um, when we started this project, really long before we started this project, we were having conversations with, with landowner partners and asking if there was a role for NRCS in technical assistance and financial assistance delivery to deal with the impact large carnivores are having on livestock producers. And from the livestock producer partner, livestock producers and various partners, we heard a pretty clear resounding yes. And so in 2020, when NRCS identified non-lethal predator control as a priority for funding in the National Conservation Innovation Grant, um, we, we applied. And um, really the reason livestock producers and partners have said yes, they believe there is a role, is that NRCS is one of the most trusted partners in providing assistance on working lands with the goal of balancing stewardship and agricultural production. 
And with this in mind, there are really two guiding principles throughout this project. All of the project deliverables must provide value both to landowners and to NRCS. And um, we recognize that that comes along with a lot of critical input from, from all of our partners. And today we're gonna really focus, I'm gonna focus in this presentation on the potential role of NRCS. So I just wanted to share that um, we have, NRCS has drafted an interim practice standard with strong support from producers and all of the partners on this project. And um, we're really asking if there's a way NRCS can support delivery of these practices on the ground and whether it's through an interim practice standard or other mechanisms, um, we know that those of you that are work for NRCS are familiar with the planning process. And so we believe that what we're about to share is a good way to start thinking about that planning process. So um, this framework and risk assessment or practice evaluation supports this conservation planning process and really helps I focus on steps one through six. So if you start at the very beginning by identifying problems and opportunities, you know, as we think about the three practices that we've covered in this webinar series, they don't apply to every producer and they, they don't apply everywhere. There are specific locations where the risk of conflict is high. And so this risk assessment and practice evaluation is really a selection process. I wanted to highlight that there is an existing conservation practice standard animal mortality facility that covers a lot of carcass management topics. It's really designed for dairy facilities or poultry facilities where death loss is a regular ongoing thing that happens, you know, in substantial quantities. Um, for beef or sheep range operations. Death loss is a little bit more sporadic and it's really inefficient to manage these carcasses on farm. And it can actually, by managing them on farm, increase the risk of predation. So I um, just wanted to call out that there is a need to address carcass management at a community scale um, where it's, it's more cost effective, to be frank. In order to keep carcasses from becoming an attractant, they have to be secured. That requires additional infrastructure, and that's really often most cost effective when provided at the community scale. So um, it also provides another level of efficiency in meeting the regulatory requirements that may exist at both you know, state and county levels to address biosecurity and water quality. So um, with this, we think that the conservation planning framework, which is typically done at NRCS on an individual operation can still work. And there's precedent for this within the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, there was new language added that allowed water management entities to be able to contract with NRCS. So we think there are opportunities to um, address this particular issue of carcass management at the community scale, delivering, providing carcass management services, infrastructure also at a community scale. So, um, this framework, these five factors um, have, have been developed by the core SIG team and it really represents the collective knowledge and experience of over 600 landowners um, represented by our various project partners across the West. And so we've really thought about how and where to apply these three practices on the landscape. And these five factors we think give the framework to identify how and where to apply these practices. So the first is species. Um, the livestock, predators, and prey, and the density of those animals across the landscape need to be considered um, in identifying areas of risk. And then place um, consists of the biotic and abiotic conditions that influence the risk of predation. Time, again, we're talking about temporal changes over time. Um, with predators expanding across the West, um, that interacts both um, over time and then there are seasonal or annual production cycle changes that, that include a temporal 
time component. Um, and disturbance is another important factor to consider, whether it's drought or fire or other disturbance events that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, these things may change predator-prey dynamics and distribution, so it's something to consider when you're determining where to implement a practice. And then last is landscape use or land use. So, so the size, the, the type of landscape you're operating on, and the spatial relationships across that landscape um, between people, livestock, wildlife are all important to consider. And so we'll come back to that idea and talk about it in terms of landscape stratification in a minute. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about each one of these factors first. So um, if you think about species, predators or different predators require different responses, right? You don't, you don't manage for wolves and grizzly bears the same way. They hunt and use the landscape in different ways. Um, with livestock, it's important to consider the type of livestock, both the species and age classes because there are different production cycles and different risk factors associated with different species and different age classes. And then last, um, it's important to consider the native prey base and how they're using the landscape, what their life history cycle is. For place, um, it's important to consider terrain. You know, is it rough, rolling, is it open? Um, it's also important to think about visibility, right? What type of cover is there? Is it a highly timbered environment um, high, or, or are there thick willows? These all impact which practices can be applied and where. And similarly, the vegetation community type is important. The density of vegetation, particularly when it comes to carcass management, determines access to the site. And if you think about time, um, you know, it, there are times of the year, depending on the predator species, when the risk of conflict is much higher. And that has to do with both the annual life cycle of the predator and the production cycle of the livestock. Um, so it's important that we know where our animals are on the landscape at any given time and how that relates to where the wildlife is. And then we, you know, can look for areas where Livestock and predators coincide in both space and time. Um, the fourth factor, disturbance. I mentioned earlier, fire, drought, but um, it's also important to consider how snowpack it affects animal movements. And um, recreational use is also important to consider. And, and, you know, hunting is listed as a separate bullet here, but let's think about hunting as a type of recreational use and how that influences both predator and native prey distribution over time. So we know from producers that are operating within our network that in some cases, for example, in Montana, the start of elk hunting season on, in one community actually reduces the risk of predation. But in Northeast Oregon, there's you know a community that feels like the start of archery season increases the risk to their operations. So, you know, there, the impact of different recreational uses um, changes risk over time on the landscape. And this is a type of disturbance. So last, I want to touch on landscape or land use. So the size of the operation really influences which tools are practical. Um, so I think that's really important when you think about carcass management, right? How much time do you invest in removing a carcass from a landscape? It has to be practical. And so I want to offer um, this, this idea that Breeze developed over time along with NRCS about landscape stratification. So um, depending on the predator life cycle, the annual production of the livestock, some places on the landscape may at certain times of the year be more human occupied or more predator occupied. So, and then, you know, somewhere in between would be shared. And so I've got a map here to show you all to help demonstrate this idea. So, um, and I think for those of you that are working for NRCS, you might think about 
this map as part of the conservation planning process, similar to developing a conservation plan map um, and developing a grazing management plan and thinking through the infrastructure to support a prescribed grazing plan. Or you're really mapping out resources that are available, you're mapping out the goals of the operation, the landscape condition, and all this is, you know, spatially and temporally addressing a resource concern. Um, so producers, I think it's, you know, possible you guys can think about this within your operation. So if you think about carcass management, um, as I said earlier, road access in the vegetation community is really important. So think about how that would be distributed across the landscape, right? Obviously within a large timbered area um, with no roads, the opportunity for carcass management is, is not high. Um, and so, you know, we think with NRCS, this with NRCS support, this type of practice would most likely apply to accessible areas of the ranch, like around the farmstead, or areas like a weaning pasture, calving pasture that are primarily human occupied. Um, it's not a practice that can be applied across an entire landscape. And by focusing carcass management efforts um, in areas that are primarily human occupied or areas with good accessibility, there's really an opportunity for a win-win solution here where it can re carcass management can reduce the risk to human safety, it can reduce the risk of predators coming into conflict with people and livestock, and it can improve production practices. And so with that, Jared, I think I'll close this presentation out and, and hand it back to you. Great, thank you, Alex. And you know, it, it really is uh, a great framework uh, to consider when you're starting to think about um, the implementation of these tools, especially uh, from an early uh, thought process. And that kind of leads into um, kind of our, our next presenter uh, before we get into our panel discussion. Uh, we're gonna hear from Kyle Tackett, um, Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships in Montana who will be sharing with us today uh, Montana's approach to conservation delivery and, and how that, you know, supporting conflict reduction practices is, is kind of being put on the, the ground a little bit. Uh, uh, and, and he can kind of explain a little bit better uh, as well. And so with that, I'll let you take it away there, Kyle. All right. Thanks, Jared. Can you hear me all right? I can. All right. Um, first, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today. I'm not going to do a PowerPoint or anything. We'll just have a little talk here, and I'll do my best to answer questions as they come up. Um, thanks to Jared and Alex, you know, for all the work both of you have done, and Bree as well, uh, for putting this this third of, of the series of webinars together. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, it's raised a lot of questions from an NRCS standpoint and good conversation, I know, internally. Um, you know, and how we're responsive to partner needs and also trying to fit it into, you know, agency policy and how we've done business in the past and kind of navigate that, um, navigate that process a little bit. And I think before we talk about Montana, I think it's worth just stepping back a little bit. Um, Alex talked about the interim practice that's been developed. Um, so that's been submitted to headquarters and, and we have a group of folks kind of diving into that and figuring out what, what is the best option for NRCS to deliver maybe one interim practice or maybe it's several, maybe it's three, maybe it's one. Do we combine all three of these into one interim practice? Um, or do we break it out and, and maybe use three existing practices that are kind of close, but maybe not quite quite there like that animal mortality that, that Alex mentioned. It's similar, but there's some distinct differences. Um, you know, we have a structure for wildlife practice. Um, Fladry could maybe be, be used under there, but we're not sure yet. Um, range riding, you know, we've looked at, well, could we offer that under prescribed grazing or, um, you know, an existing practice like that? So we are looking at a lot of options. One, just this interim standard and can all three of them be be done under that or do we need to break it out and I think it's an opportunity for our staff to look at the pros and cons of all of them um, and come up with a solution 
And I think it's also worth mentioning that, that especially for non-NRCS folks on this call, we have to tie everything we do to a resource concern. And as it stands today, we don't have a resource concern that aligns perfectly um, with this effort. And that's okay. Um, we're looking into, you know, do we need to tie it to one that again, maybe isn't a, a perfect fit, but will work? Um, or do we need to look at, look at maybe developing a new resource concern? And so I think it's important for folks to understand before we adopt something like this, we have to tie it to a resource concern. And those discussions are underway um, and, and are informed by this work and um, the work that Alex and the group has done and Jared has been just invaluable in helping with this conversation. Um, our plan as an agency is still to, to move forward to, to have a decision ready by FY24. Um, we just started fiscal year 23, so that gives us about 12 months to get ready to see what we can roll out. And there are no guarantees. We need to work through this process and see um, see where these practices may fit into our, you know, our business model. And so I think, I, I think to transition to Montana a little bit, I think the key for how we do business here, and I think the key to how this conversation um, has really spent a lot of time in Montana is on that locally led process. Um, so in Montana, we do implement um, kind of a strategic focused approach to conservation, and, and we think that's best done locally. And so through local working groups and, and, and partnerships, if, if local landowners um, find something like this to be beneficial, something they need, then it works up through um, a long range plan in our field offices. And then we can write a targeted implementation plan to ask for money um, through our equip allocation to, to work with producers. And so I think it's key in that how we look at this is it's not a, a state down approach, top down approach, it's really locally led. And, and I think through our effort over the last couple of years and, and really leaning on partners like the Blackfoot Challenge and Seth Wilson that we'll, we'll hear from soon, um, we've been able to, to work through that and actually get a, get a practice on the ground um, looking at electrified um, grizzly mats. And I think that's being responsive to that locally led process. But I think it's key too for folks to understand that, that we can't do everything. Um, so we have to take that advice and that, that maybe request for participation or a new practice and, and run it through our process and, and figure out where, um, where it fits. Maybe, maybe we need to change the box we've been playing in a little bit and, and be, um, be a little more flexible and, and willing to do some of this stuff that, it, that really does impact the local producers. So I think in Montana, the key for us, Jared, is, you know, and others has been that locally led process and conversations with partners. So it's not catching anybody off guard. Um, you know, we've had conversations with producer groups, with other agencies to make sure we're all talking. Um, and that the sense isn't that we're playing in, you know, maybe other folks arena, but that we're all actually working together to try to find a solution um, to something that is impacting landowners in our state. Um, so I, I think really that's what I wanted to talk about and just get it out there that we are working through this process. We have a lot of questions. You know, you guys have challenged us and landowners have challenged us to come up with a solution and it's different, something we haven't dealt with in the past. And so I, I guess we appreciate being challenged, but we also, it's gonna take some time to work through, um, work through our processes and figure out the best way to roll this out. And we look forward to, um, the coming year and seeing what we can come up with in FY24. I think carcass management is one of those complicated ones that Alex hit on because of the contracting. We contract with local producers one-on-one -on -one with, with farmers, ranchers um, on a voluntary basis. And, and where I live and work in Montana, there's several community-based carcass composting operations already underway and they're community-led. So um, how can we, how could we move forward um, contract or participate when they're more community led? And I agree, they tend to be probably a little more successful when they are at that. Um, so we're looking at that, that question, that issue and figuring out how we can best, um, best address it. So Jared, I'll take any questions or I'll respond to the written ones as well as we go along here. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. We really appreciate that perspective and, and you taking the time to join us today. And again, we're just really grateful and appreciative of NRCS's partnership and participation. 
uh, as we work through this. And yeah, you can certainly hear, you know, as, as Kyle mentioned, we understand this is a process. There's a lot of steps uh, along the way that have to be met uh, until we can get to potentially the availability of some of these. And it's just really great uh, to see the enthusiasm and the conversations uh, and the thought going into some of these processes right now and and today hopefully we can we can add and continue that conversation a little bit um, and with that we're just going to jump right into our, our panel discussion and you're going to hear about different carcass management practices being implemented across a lot of different landscapes and one of the questions I was just looking through um, the chat box was you know more you know the definition of carcass management and that you know that's a great you no know, place to start is it looks a little bit different depending on where you are, but essentially we're talking about uh, the broadly the removal or securing of of dead animals, dead carcasses, and how that looks. Um, you know, we're going to hear how that might look a little bit different on a couple different perspectives today. And so, um, our panelists, I'm going to just uh, list them uh, briefly and and jump right in. Dr. Seth Wilson. Uh, the executive director for the Blackfoot Challenge. Uh, he comes with decades of experience working around resolving issues with people and wildlife. I believe he's joining us from, from a human bear uh, conference uh, right now. So he, he's, he's multitasking on, on, on multiple fronts with this. And he has experience not only in the U.S., but broadly in, in Canada and Europe as well. Um, Linda Owens, uh, project director for the Madison Valley's Ranchling Group. Uh, besides, um, you know, advancing uh, Madison Valley Ranchling's group's mission, she's also a producer and probably the nicest and most genuine person you'll ever meet. Um, and we've got uh, Chris Camarina, the director of, of public works from Prairie City, Oregon. Um, he'll offer a, a different regional perspective, and, and he's right in the thick of this conversation right now. This is a, a little bit newer uh, of a carpet, carcass management program, and, and he's been right in the thick of it from the start. And so we'll have a really great Oregon perspective on this as well. We have uh, Steve Prim, also located in southwest Montana, and really a, a wearer of many different hats and titles over the years, but again, comes with decades of wildlife experience aimed towards uh, advancing, you know, both rangeland stewardship and wildlife conservation in the American West. Uh, and then lastly, Dr. Casey DeAtling, Associate Professor uh, within the College of Ag at Cal State University, Chico. And she's right in the middle of these, you know, research questions and these same conversations, both, you know, from a research and professional interest uh, in California and her background uh, at Cal State Chico is, uh, you know, beef cattle production and rangeland science and management, among uh, many others. And so a, a very awesome panel today. I'm really excited for it and not to waste any more time. People didn't come to hear me talk. So uh, with that, I'm going to just jump right in. And our first question, which will be presented uh, to each of our panelists is, you know, where are you located and what's your landscape look like? Because we've talked about how this might change regionally and, and how are you using carcass management right now? So how does carcass management look to you where you're located? And with that, uh, Seth uh, Wilson, if, if you don't mind jumping in to tell us kind of about the Blackfoot Challenge and and how um, Carcass looks in where you are. Thanks, thanks, Jared, and thanks uh, to everyone who's who's on this webinar today. Um, and I really appreciate being here. So, um, the Blackfoot Challenge is a community-based, uh, not-for-profit. Uh, our origins go back to the 1970s. Uh, it was formed by landowners and we incorporated uh, as an NGO in 1993. Um, we're, we're based out in Western Montana uh, in the Blackfoot watershed, which is about 1.5 million acres. That's roughly the same size as the state of Delaware for a little comparison. If you can just uh, in your mind's eye, uh, think about Glacier National Park. Uh, if, you, if you go south down through the Bob Marshall Wilderness area, you'll eventually come down to the, to the Blackfoot watershed. Um, it's primarily agricultural and forestry at, at this stage. Um, 
We've got multi-generational cow-calf ranching operations, as I mentioned, forestry uh, and recreation and tourism are, are the sort of primary land uses. Uh, if, any, if any of you have seen um, Robert Redford's film, A River Runs Through It, that is, that is our iconic river, uh, the Blackfoot. About 60% of, of the watershed is in public ownership, about 40% in private ownership. We have about 1,300 perennial streams and several large tributaries uh, into the Blackfoot River. This creates a really uh, lush uh, system of riparian habitats, wetlands, productive, you know, productive uh, grazing lands, and a mixture of forests uh, and, and native grasslands. To be very quick uh, about sort of the history, we, we didn't have grizzly bears in the Blackfoot watershed for, for many, many years until around the late 19. 90s when uh, our first conflicts with bears began. Um, between 1998 and 2001, we had uh, multiple livestock confirmed depredations by grizzly bears. We actually had a human fatality, an elk hunter, uh, Timothy Hilston. All of those events created quite a bit of concern and um, we started working with the community uh, through the auspices of of the NGO I mentioned, the Blackfoot Challenge. And I uh, had the great fortune to, to be the first wildlife uh, coordinator and had you know, the real privilege to work with an amazing group of state and federal biologists, NGOs, and uh, other stakeholders to eventually wrestle with, with this question of how do we reduce conflicts with grizzly bears. We started livestock carcass removal in 2003. Uh, we, we knew bears and particularly females with cubs were using uh, uh, boneyards uh, and we, we use, um, we've used carcass management when we started uh, primarily as a seasonal tool uh, and Alex mentioned some of that seasonality. Um, so we first started our program um, to manage carcasses and to remove carcasses off of ranches and to actually phase out those boneyards from February through May. Over the years, we originally started with rendering uh, livestock carcasses. That became, uh, no longer became an option. We then landfilled uh, carcasses in, in the neighboring city of Missoula. That became expensive. And then in 2007, in a great partnership with Montana Department of Transportation, uh, we began composting uh, carcasses. So today, we have a year-round program and we're removing uh, five to 600 livestock carcasses off of four different counties on about 4 million acres. How's that, Jared? Is that kind of an overview? I think, I think that's perfect. Well, and I, I appreciate that. And sure. uh, so to kind of move uh, a little bit south in, in Montana, I will hand it over to Linda Owens to tell us a little bit about how carcass management looks in Madison Valley. Well, we're about a quarter the size of the Blackfoot in the number of carcasses we manage for the Madison Valley Ranch Land Group. And we function on the east side of Madison County. Um, let me find the correct amount. Roughly 33,603 square miles. And so probably I was looking at it, trying to add it up. We're covering over 563 square miles for our program because a lot of that other is forested where it's inaccessible. Madison Valley Ranch Land Group started in 1996 and we were based on the same premise as the Malapai Borderlands Association or group. I don't know if that's the right name. And then the Blackfoot Challenge. So those were basically the our parents, adopted parents, what we formed under. And we're a rancher-led uh, nonprofit, which fit, fit really well for all of our ranchers. They aren't used to making money. Um, we started the, the carcass pickup and composting in 2018. Um, we had grants. Um, I came in on to this uh, 2017, and it had been in the works for a long time. Steve Primmel talked to that. So I came in as pretty much a newbie and didn't realize that people kept telling us no. So anyway, we ended up the site finally. 
And like I said, we're only about a quarter because in four years, I've picked up a little over 500 carcasses. So um, in four years, we're doing what the Blackfoot does in one year. Um, it's been really good though. Um, it's pulling the community and the ranchers together because we have a lot of subdivisions, small landowners, and they need a place to put their horses or their cows or their sheep. Um, it's been a really good outreach. And I just think that the more advocates we have for ranching and taking care of our resources, um, it's a win-win for keeping ranching viable in Madison County. Excellent, thank you, Linda. And uh, kind of stick to a little bit of the same area, but uh, a, a kind of slightly different perspective on a program. Uh, Steve, uh, how about you kind of give us a perspective a little bit of the kind of Alder, Sheridan kind of region uh, in Montana? Sure, and uh, yeah, let me know if my connection starts to break up. So um, what we're talking about there is the Ruby Valley area Ruby watershed uh, on the western half of Madison County. Uh, so similar numbers to what Linda's describing. Um, uh, it's a the, the settled part of the valley, uh, all the deeded land. It's about 30 miles north to south. Uh, about 30 different producers there. Madison County total has um, latest numbers was 52,000 mother cows. So beef production is a big deal here. Um, and quite a few producers. Uh, we are probably, I, I'd say we're uh, uh, similar to where the Blackfoot was 25 years ago, maybe, uh, as grizzly bears moved back into this, this environment. We have had uh, wolves moving through periodically ever since reintroduction in the mid 90s. Uh, but the grizzlies, that's been a relatively new thing, particularly at lower elevations. Um, they tend to be in the southern part of the county up on the public lands. Um, but increasingly we're getting them closer and closer to, to civilization. Um, so we're trying to get ahead of that by, by having carcass management and uh, other attractive management strategies in the communities like, like garbage management. Um, so the, uh, the Ruby uh, carcass program, uh, that's run by the Ruby Valley Conservation District, NRCS, um, primarily started with Livestock Loss Board funding. Um, really grateful for that. Um, we have a, a, a Patagonia outlet in Dillon, the next county uh, to the south, and they actually bought us the dump trailer um, for, um, for the carcass program. Uh, and ranchers and a number of nonprofits have also been key partners in, in launching this program. Uh, it took roughly a decade to find an acceptable site. Finally, uh, the town of Sheridan um, allowed us to use Use their old county landfill or their, their old um, city uh, dump site um, about three miles south of Sheridan um, as our, our carcass compost site. Uh, we overcame quite a few hurdles, addressed quite a few community concerns about the very concept of livestock uh, carcass composting. Um, and finally, in 2021, we started um, initially picking up carcasses and taking them, uh, taking them in and composting them at that facility. Uh, there's quite a bit of interest and demand from producers to, uh, to get those dead piles off their places. The initial year, we took in over 100 carcasses, slightly fewer um, in 2022, um, but still a, uh, a thriving program. Um, and uh, a lot of community community interest in it. So uh, I can speak to later on if we get into details about it, um, overcoming some of the uh, community concerns about the health and safety issues of, of carcass composting, um, because we we really really dug into that in a big way to address um, uh, concerns at the, at the community and the county level um, to uh, to uh, finally uh, get regulatory approval for for the, the uh, composting site there in in the Ruby. Excellent, thank thank you, Steve. And um, yeah, as, as Steve mentioned, Paul, you know we've got you know just a few questions kind of staged up here to kind of dig into this, some of these issues, but. Please feel free. There's a Q and A option down below to go ahead and start posing some of your questions, and we're getting some really good ones in. And in fact, one of them that just popped up is is almost essentially kind of our, our next stage question. But before we do that, uh, uh, Chris, why don't you give us a little perspective of how things look in Prairie City, Oregon? Uh, 
I believe you're on mute. There. All right. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry about that. Yes, sir. So the city of Prairie City has a uh, relatively new animal composting facility um, that uh, we developed uh, in some teamwork with Oregon Department of Transportation to uh, on our end. I, I live in the John Day Valley. Um, we're at the foot of the Strawberry and Blue Mountains. Um, we're, our landscape uh, in our area is uh, primarily a high desert, uh, a lot of sagebrush and juniper. Um, we we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, local and cattle ranches around our facility and then up into uh, national forests and state lands. Um, our facility we um, built out after looking at different areas. We found an area out where our kind of lagoon system is from our wastewater facility. Um, it was out of town. Um, I pumped my wastewater three miles out of town and uh, towards the town of John Day. But it was up in a site where uh, we didn't have to worry about uh, neighbors um, and, and that or, or any kind of disturbance. Um, but we, uh, we built this facility. It's a small facility. Um, our, our whole landscape is probably 200 foot by 200 foot. Um, but it, uh, um, it serves our community well um, down in this area. Um, the, uh, um, our team worked with uh, with the other agencies or how we sustain out here to, to, to keep it running. But uh, we, we get uh, most of our uh, animals come from Oregon Department of Transportation, um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, State Police, uh, and a lot of from road struck animals um, is primarily um, what we're receiving, um, and some from private, from ranchers. Great, thank you, thank you, Chris and uh, uh, and Casey. Uh, now you, we'll let you jump in and provide kind of a, a, a researcher's perspective on some of these questions being asked uh, in, in some of your areas in in Northern California. That's great. Thanks so much, Jared, for having me, and thanks for Bree, or thanks to Bree for connecting us. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm learning as much as I hope I contribute, um, and so. I am, um, by, by day, I'm a college professor at Chico State, which is in Northern California. So Chico is, sorry, that is kind of right there. Um, we're in the Central Valley, the east side of the Central Valley. And um, on the, the evenings and the weekends, I'm also a cow-calf operator. And so I have really strong relationships with our Cattlemen's Association. Um, and that gets to be pretty fun because um, we get to do some, some research for them. And that's really where our composting effort came out of is it's been driven by industry. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But as far as our terrain, um, We've got it all. So um, California is primarily a Mediterranean climate. So um, we have hot, dry summers and falls and mild, usually wet, not always, but usually wet uh, winters and springs. And so that um, climate has really lent itself to what I'll call transient um, livestock production. So um, cattle and sheep tend to graze in the Central Valley during the late fall, winter, and spring, and then they'll be transported to higher elevations or out of state a lot of times um, during the summers to graze kind of forested uh, BLM ground at higher elevations. And so trucking is a huge part of our um, budget as far from a cattle perspective or from a cattle production perspective. And sorry, I don't mean to neglect the sheep producers. I'm just a cattle producer. So I'm going to, I'm going to reference that quite often. Um, and so our, um, composting project really came from a question that came from, um, the California Cattlemen's Association leadership of like, hey, we're, it's getting really, really expensive to render animals. We have a lot of livestock production in California. So cattle and calves are number four or five um, annually um, for the last probably 15 to 20 years, as far as com ag commodities in California. Um, 
And dairy and milk products sat at number one for a long, long time. And so we have a lot of dairies and we have a lot of livestock, um, cattle and calves specifically. And so um, even though we're seeing kind of mass exodus of everybody from California, sorry, sorry to all of our neighboring states um, that you guys are getting a lot of our folks in. And um, but it's getting harder and harder to operate in this state. I'll be quite honest. Um, it for our small hundred cow hundred head cow calf operation, it takes a veterinarian, a truck driver slash farmer, and a college professor to make it run. Um, so our our costs are really high, and so um, that is where this question about composting really came from. Is because our rendering plants are shutting down. There's only three left in the state, um, and it's the closest one to us is Sacramento. So um, where our ranch is at, up in the northeastern corner, um, that is about a four and a half um, hour drive to Sacramento, and so we. Uh, are starting to experience a lot of carcass management issues. So, and cost is being the biggest driver of that. So it takes approximately $125 for a carcass pickup from the rendering company out of Sacramento. And that doesn't matter, as you guys probably know, if it's a mature cow or if it's a calf that was lost at birth it, for dystocia issues. And so um, there has been a uh, I'll, I'll say it, I won't tell you who it will, but there's been a long time um, mentality of shoot, shovel and shut up in this state. And it's getting to the point that we're no longer able to do that as producers. And so this effort um, was really started in the context of a research question. And I'm so very happy that we started that way and we're continuing to to go that way because there's one other group in California up in Siskiyou County that started this effort in 2000 and 2017 and basically with uh, minimal regard for the um, regulatory agencies in the state and they still have not gotten off the ground to my knowledge and so by us take kind of taking a research approach approach and building relationships we're now into year two of composting um, at our chico state facility which part of it you can see in the picture um, on my uh, screen and um, we're we are making tremendous progress um, because we've done a lot of footwork and a lot of relationship building with all of our agencies. And um, when we started, we had no idea who those agencies were. So our process has very much became a do something, get our hands slapped, say we're sorry, and hopefully we've been lucky so far. We haven't had fines, but then those people come into our network because there we asked and asked and asked um, at the state level lobbyists, regulatory agencies who all needed to be involved in the conversation. And they gave us about half the people. And so a lot of our um, process has been trial and error. And um, I that was really, really hard for the first two years because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and like to do things right. Um, so getting delayed um, for a year before we could start and get the site approved and that type of thing was a little bit hard. But looking back, I'm still very happy that we approach this from a research perspective um, because we now have an on-site exemption that is being approved right now with our Cal with our recycling agency. So Cal Recycle um, for small on-farm composting, which is a beautiful first step. And we're going to have a workshop um, the end of November, right before Thanksgiving, um, bringing all the agency personnel together to have a really productive conversation about how do we move the process into legislation. So we're, um, yeah, we've got lots of issues, but it really has come down to building relationships is what's made us successful. Right. Uh, thank you for that, Casey. And you basically, you know, covered uh, your region and, and basically, you know, where we're headed uh, with our next question. And, and that's how can partnerships play a role in supporting carcass management and what makes a carcass management uh, partnership successful? And, and you mentioned grant funding and, and a lot of industry and, and trying to identify some of those ideal, you know, future partners. And so uh, thank you for 
for that kind of picture there. Um, and so with that, I'll probably turn it uh, to Linda to, to tell us a little bit about partnerships uh, with the Madison Valley uh, Ranchlands Group and, and their carcass management program. Okay. Casey's got the right idea for how to go about making it work. It takes people working together. It's not going to work. Um, our funding came from other nonprofits. Um, I'll name them off here. And I have them on the sign at the compost site where you turn in off the highway. I think it's important for the public to recognize that the site is there and to also tie that together with those conservation groups. Um, so we had people in carnivores, uh, the livestock loss board, which is of course directly livestock related. Then we had Vital Ground Foundation. We had Wildlife Conservation Society and we had Fish and Wildlife, sorry, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation gave us some really key money. And now we are part of uh, the CIG Conservation Innovation Grant, which is helping keeping us funded. Um, it's a huge challenge. He's trying to keep the site running because when I established the site with Steve's help and all these others, I, I was adamant that the rancher shouldn't be the one footing the bill. Um, we had always been able to dispose of, of carcasses on the ranches, or you could just bury them and not worry about it. But with bears, bears dig, and there's really nothing that they won't dig up. The wolves aren't, the wolves aren't our huge issue here. Um, they will come in and scavenge. They're going to predate anyway. But our main concern right now is the grizzly bears trying to keep the public safe also. So in western, southwestern Montana, public safety is tied to removing those carcasses off the landscape. They can't, that way the public cannot see or blame the ranchers for uh, when there's conflict between hunters or recreationists out there. And we also have to be really careful just even having ranchers or the range riders out there with the grizzlies. They both scavenge, but they're different levels of predation on humans. Um, so our site's not fancy and we, it costs us about 45 to $50,000 a year to run it. And I'm going on the high side. I don't want to have someone shocked thinking that they're gonna build a site and end up the costing a whole lot more. But MSU, Montana State University, um, are partners with us. They have yet to come in and do experimentation or projects there, but they're more than welcome to. And um, it's a signed partnership. Um, the more we can help educate the public through uh, tours, the better. I mean, partnerships are more than just getting money in there. It is that public acceptance and when you get the public involved, it helps tie, again, like I said before, helps tie the community together. And it takes that, I would call it the bullseye off the ranchers for the blame because it's showing that the ranchers are trying to be proactive in reducing conflict. And it's a big win, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And, and this is great there, you know, as Alex put that framework together, we're thinking about species and land use and, and all those components, you can see, you know, the, the panelists are listing a lot of these thought processes that went into some of these programs. And they're also answering questions in, in the Q&A. So I have to just thank my my excellent panelists so far. They're, they're making my job really easy here. But um, to kind of stick along those same lines, uh, Steve, I, I know you've been uh, a huge part of that with Linda. Um, do you have anything to add there before we hear from, from Chris and Seth? Uh, no, I think Linda covered it fairly well there. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I agree with Linda that uh, we sh should find ways to not have the burden fall on the producers uh, to, to run these programs. 
Thank you for that, Steve. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, partnerships, how, do, how does that look with Prairie City, Oregon there? Oh, uh, Linda spoke great about this. A lot of uh, the issues they're having are the same ones that we're having out here with partnerships. When we first started our facility, you know, we teamed up with the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation. And like I said, we were, we were trying to figure out what to do with uh, basically the road strikes on the highway. Um, and for, for years, they were just kind of shoving them in a hole somewhere and, uh, and or they weren't picking them up at all. And in our corridor down here, we um, on Highway 26, we're three hours from Bend, three hours from Boise, three hours from Pendleton, kind of right in the middle of nowhere out here in this valley. But uh, um, we this main we're the main corridor for all the cycle tours that go from uh, from up in Newport, Oregon, all the way to Virginia Beach. We have a lot of motorcyclists and and a lot of travel to here, recreational travel. And that's what they were seeing was these road struck animals just rotting alongside the highways. Didn't really promote our tourism very well um, that we depend on here. Um, but when we first started talking about this facility, the city, of Prairie City didn't have the funding. We're a small community of just around a thousand people. Um, we didn't have the funding to, to build a facility like this that was really needed. So we teamed up with Oregon Department of Transportation. They actually, um, uh, it paid for a lot of the, the facility. We did a lot of in-kind work with uh, you know, operators and equipments, but it's uh, to put it together and it's worked out great. Our, you know, we, we uh, our part of our payback to them is, you know, we, we won't charge them for so long to, to bring uh, carcasses into our facility. And that's how we're partnering with them. And it's working out really well. Um, We've tried to team up with uh, a lot of different agencies out here, kind of in the same way, um, you know, but uh, as we're starting to get more animals, uh, um, especially with during hunting season with the uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife State Police. Right now, it's a lot of bears. We're uh, just, uh, we're getting a lot of uh, road struck bears. Um, we're, we're working uh, with DEQ on, uh, I have wastewater lagoons. I irrigate, I have two valley pivots that I irrigate my affluent wastewater. Um, about 30 million gallons a year, and we uh, we're working on some uh, beneficial use crop up there that will um, will plant uh, you know, radish, some some triticale, some uh, uh, crop that maybe will keep the elk and and uh, and uh, and deer and stuff up off the highways to keep it up on our property. I have about 250 acres, and keep it out of the the ranch lands down below, and from keep keep them from eating the the ranchers food for their cattle um, and uh, so we're hoping that this will tie in and maybe if we can keep them up off there and it'll reduce our uh, our risks and, and and reduce maybe them having to come into our facility but uh, it's been a, a big teamwork with with everybody you know um, I kind of thought we were out here alone with this project until I met um, Ellie Lane Gage and introduced me to to this part of it but for sustainability for us for us to continue to do this in the future, we we can't do it uh, without without help from like in NRCS. I work with them on my wastewater side, and they're great people to work with. Um, and uh, you know, for, we've we've had them up doing um, soil monitoring sampling for on my wastewater side for our irrigation sites. They're great people in our area to work with, but we can't uh, sustain without without help from, from uh, these other outside agencies like that. And it's been a great, great thing so far. Like I said, Lee and Ellie, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's opened up a, a whole new world that, uh, and kind of a relief for us that maybe there's help out there. Um, wow, thanks thanks for uh, that perspective, uh, Chris. And uh, Seth, uh, uh, I know that, you know, your program kind of has a long history there. So, um, you know, may, a little bit on, on partnership and, and successful partnerships on your end. Sure, thanks. Um, and a great, great discussion thus far. Um, I guess the, the big take home is that partnerships are uh, vital um, and they're extremely beneficial at oh, many levels. Um, they've really helped us keep our costs down. As I mentioned, we started back in 2003 uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we were awarded some grants that helped actually launch our whole wildlife program, and part of that was was sort of the jump-starting of, of our carcass work. 
the NRCS, we were awarded a conservation innovation grant in 2005. That was um, really to sort of see if we could test this whole idea out uh, under under their practice standards. And so that that really helped us uh, really increase the, the the depth and breadth of our program. Um, some of the nuts and bolts in terms of the partnerships, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 19 years now has provided uh, the truck and all the diesel fuel on an annual basis. Um, and as I mentioned, by 2007, Montana Department of Transportation had developed uh, a site to, car to uh, compost road to kill deer and elk. And uh, they were very generously willing to uh, try livestock carcasses in 2007. So you had Montana Department of Transportation uh, really providing that cr critical composting site. Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks has helped us with some of the management and science in terms of priority, prioritizing uh, boneyards for removal. They've helped with uh, some of the initial fence costs to secure that MDT composting site. Uh, and then the Blackfoot Challenge with with support from the Livestock Loss Board, Defenders of Wildlife, Vital Ground, Nature Conservancy, and many donors and many, many private foundations that we uh, have turned to for almost 20 years for support have helped cover the costs of our contracted drivers for that uh, February through May period and then for the balance of, of the season. The Blackfoot Challenge also, we made an investment with MDT at the site early on to help uh, we developed a well so that they have water at that site. And over the years, we've we've upgraded uh, the electric fence fencing to help uh, you know keep bears and wolves and other scavengers out of the site. So the you know it it wouldn't have it wouldn't be possible to run our program without all those partners. The annual cost is about twenty five thousand. Wow, uh, I, I appreciate that, Seth, and and um been following the the q a here so i'm i'm going to kind of uh, develop uh kind of our final question here to run through the panelists as an opportunity to encompass quite a few that i see coming in a lot are uh regarding you know building trust within your community and logistics can sometimes be overwhelming what are some of these key considerations or key hurdles uh to get over there's regulatory biosecurity questions um coming in and so I, I really see is in terms of this uh, as a final question to each of the panelists is what early considerations or hurdles help the most when when thinking about your carcass management program or has helped the most in terms of uh, being key to your program's uh, success and so you know, uh, Chris, you're kind of right in the thick of it right now. So I'll, I'll kind of punt this one to you first is, you know, what what have been some of those key considerations on y'all's end? Okay, one of the nice things that, that I had on my end, it was challenging with even on our on the county level to get the permitting. You know, I went through because we put this on our on our site that's uh, is for our lagoons for our wastewater um, treatment. Um, going through DEQ was was really good. Uh, developing them partnerships. I'd work with DEQ. We used to have a, a small landfill here, so I'd worked with their solid waste management folks before. And so I just started putting feelers out to them as to what I needed to do because there had never been one in this area before like this. And our our poor lady at um, the county level for planning, she didn't know where to start, but. Um, I'm fortunate my mayor, Jim Hampshire, is also a county court commissioner here for Grant County. And so we kind of teamed up and uh, and uh, and kind of trudged through this process. And it was a long process. It took a lot of time, um, a lot of back and forth, uh, you know, on, on on with this end of it. Once we got everything kind of cleared with the EQ to put it on our facility, we looked at uh, lots of different ones. But... Uh, you know, once we, we got that all established, uh, and it was getting, you know, uh, making sure we had equipment to, to do that, uh, to, you know, be out there because we needed to leave equipment out there. Um, we had to go through, um, I have two ranch, uh, ranches that we access our facility through. So getting the logistics through there with the easements and, and that was, it was a little time consuming. Um, and, uh, you know, some of our, being a small community, some of our equipment was a little dilapidated. So 
we're still working on that process uh, on trying to, to secure some funding to to fix that equipment so that I can leave a backhoe out there. Um, and but access and egress into the facility, you know, the ranchers, you know, they they didn't want a lot of people in and out of there. So we, you know, we we spent money that we really didn't have to buy a dump trailer so that we could, uh, you know, um, have that and and uh, a vehicle to haul um, the carcasses if we need to. Um, so we're slowly kind of working through it with what we have. Um, you know, there that's our time with the city. I only have three public works people in my staff, so you know we 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 kind of had to change our time around as to how we manage it. Uh, um, we have to go out and do an inspection every day of our system anyway, so we've just kind of incorporated this into our day uh, to do our our temperatures. We do temperatures and and moisture monitoring every day. My facility is it's not real big, um, and but it's and it's secured with uh, just a chain link fence. Uh, it's on a uh, asphalt pad and with a barbed wire around it. We haven't had any issues with uh, with uh, vector control or, or any other predators uh, trying to get into it. A lot of people uh, complained about odor, um, and uh, you know and we have it at our, our wastewater lagoons, but and you have some from there, but it's. The odor is really not bad up there. We don't have a bird problem at all, and it's open. Um, other than that, uh, just it's just a like I said, a asphalt slab with some uh, concrete barriers, kind of like it looks just like Linda's. Um, it's nothing fancy, but it it does a great job out there um, um, for us and uh, for what it's doing. We got inundated uh, pretty quickly in our project. We figured that we wouldn't get a lot of animals right off the bat, but we had a tragic uh, in John Day where one of our ranchers had three rodeo horses that got uh, road struck uh, early one morning. Uh, something, a predator spooked them and they got out on the highway and the man hit all three of them and we ended up in our facility. Um, and, uh, but it's, uh, it's been working really well. The, you know, in the summertime, you know, we, we, uh, we put a ODOT, uh, brought us a 10,000 gallon uh, water vessel to, for irrigation and we set up an irrigation system to keep the composting cool. Um, you know, we have a, a pretty good uh, defensible fire space around our facility because we are in, in range land and, and uh, so we wanted to make sure for fire access. But um, I'm also the, uh, one of the fire chiefs here. So we are, are that water uh, vessel that we use. We use it as for fire also. We've kind of teamed up with, uh, with the state ODF and then they can come in if they need to fill a truck if they have a local a fire locally and they can fill a truck off that water structure so it's good so these partnerships have been great for us um, and kind of how we'll be able to sustain in the future thanks chris uh, yeah the, the questions coming in here are excellent um you know seth i'm gonna kick it over to you for early considerations because uh you know one of them had mentioned here has talked about you know building trust uh, uh in that and you've talked about that quite a bit uh some with your program and so if you could speak to that just briefly here sure um so when we very first started this in 2003 um we collected only 63 carcasses that year and and we knew that there was uh, more more available um, to collect and we you know we sort of put on our you know the the, the uh, that relationship uh, that we have with many producers and we were able to ask you know what's going on and and we learned quickly that you know there is this concern among producers um, about neighbors knowing uh, death loss numbers and not uh, not wanting to be perceived as deficient in animal husbandry practices. And so, you know, that was an early and really important consideration. And so we designed some decentralized anonymous drop-off sites. So ranchers could actually take those carcasses to these uh, anonymous spots, take out the ear tags, and then our truck would come pick that up. Um, within about a year, we stopped that because it simply became too much work and we assured uh, our, our ranching community that, you know, no names would ever be associated with death, death loss numbers. And it's just worth mentioning, the, the agencies did not want to house any of that data. I, I was the person who, who uh, actually held all those data as an independent contractor. And that allowed me to be uh, private and confidential with all those data. And uh, it also 
protected against Freedom of Information Act requests, FOIA requests to those agencies. So just a little little deep, little side note there. But once we did that um, and you know protected that trust, um, you know uh, it, it rapidly grew to again three, four, five to that five to six hundred uh, annual carcass removal numbers we're having today. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, I think that, you know, is a real key component. Another really important question that came in and, and Steve, so I'm going to kind of direct you to an early consideration because I believe you're really well equipped to answer it. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions coming in on composting wall game and is that combined within this and, you know, roadkill and the threat of disease uh, such as CWD and a lot of the states we're talking about here. So maybe you could talk to, you know, some some biosecurity um, considerations, uh, Steve, if you're still with us. Uh, sure. And and I yeah, I think I'd probably bounce some of this over to Seth because they've got a lot more experience with uh, composting wildlife. But a lot of the um, uh, carcass composting stuff in Montana was actually started initially by Montana Department of Transportation composting roadkill. Um, at any of these sites where there's roadkill wildlife um, uh, along with domestic livestock being composted, the piles are kept very separate from each other uh, so that there's no chance of ever sending uh, potentially CWD infected uh, finished product out somewhere for a revegetation project or anything like that. Um, certainly wouldn't want to uh, put it in your garden, uh, for instance. Um, but uh, increasingly, it's looking like composting actually does uh, deactivate the uh, infectious agent in transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, known as prions. Um, so the, the research is still coming in on that. I'm seeing some uh, uh, interesting stuff out of Wisconsin um, on on uh, with some of their CWD white-tailed deer hotspots. Um, it's a very live issue for us in Madison County because we do have a CWD outbreak um, among white-tailed deer in the Ruby Valley. Um, uh, some of the deer that are probably walking by our compost site outside of Sheridan are infected with CWD. Um, so thus far, Madison County um, has restricted us from composting any um, uh, wildlife at our composting sites. So we're, we're not doing any of that. Um, but um, I, I do think that, uh, especially um, when you're talking about small animals like deer, the amount of uh, finished compost at the end is such small volume that you could conceivably just keep it on site indefinitely. Um, and that would, that, that, that would be a good way of actually uh, disposing of CWD infected, potentially CWD infected material. Um, it can go to landfills. Uh, the, the research indicates that uh, it's active for years, even, even when you bury it. So, um, you know, burial isn't a great solution every time either. Um, and what we've got in, in Madison County, we don't actually have our own landfill. Um, is that the uh, these carcasses end up uh, being dumped in with a bunch of household garbage, and then trucked across county lines to um, to a different county's landfill, um, where because it's just part of household garbage, it's actually left on the surface for quite some time before it's uh, before it's buried. So, um, I would say that uh, composting wild um, composting roadkill and, and other wildlife mortalities. Um, it, keeping it on site in, in a potential infection, infection zone is probably preferable to trucking it across county lines and, and, uh, and not treating it uh, any differently from household garbage. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like composting is very promising for, um, for dealing with TSEs. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, if you have a good secure facility that um, terrestrial, terrestrial predators, avian predators aren't going to get in there and start scattering stuff around, taking it with them someplace, um, then that, that's probably preferable to, um, to disposing of it in the landfill in many, many cases. Thanks, thanks, Steve. And I might leave a little bit of time right here at the end for uh, Casey and Linda to chime in. But Seth, did you have anything, you know, real quick to kind of tag just, on just, to the end of that? Yeah, ju just very quickly, as Steve said, the, the uh, permit that Montana Department of Transportation has with Montana DEQ requires that all composted uh, wildlife, roadkill, deer and elk, stay on site. 
So that's all being stayed on site, kept on site. Um, the, the domestic livestock byproduct compost can be used off site on non tabletop crops. Excellent. Thank you for, for that. Um, uh, Casey, with y'all's kind of research case studies going on there in California, real quickly here, just what early considerations have really helped the most kind of on y'all's end? Yeah, uh, so th thanks for that. I think, um, and I'm going to try to grab one of the questions too that Candice asked as well um, in my explanation. So gosh, the last five years have just been a roller coaster. Um, so our biggest challenge was trying to figure out whose blessing we needed to have um, moving forward, even with a, a you know, short-term research project. And um, we have kind of, we've got through that a couple of different ways. So we had people give us, you know, um, input. We reached out to different um, agencies, got them involved, and then we started the process and more agencies popped up. And so um, we did a couple tours very early on with our regional water quality boards, um, as well as our county um, environmental health people who actually do the inspections. And they gave us um, a lot of really good advice. So um, the other issue is that um, I finally just had to succeed after the first year that I could not make the data that we were collecting for the research project uh, match what the regulatory agencies needed. So I'm keeping two separate sets of records. Um, it's been a lot easier. It's a lot more work, but it's a lot easier keeping those two things um, separate. So, um, and then we're um, some of the things that have come up that oh, the from an evolution standpoint with this process is the massive mass death events that occur um, for, you know, it could be heat stroke and dairy cattle that killed, you know, 6,500 head of cows. It could be avian influenza where a herd or a flock has to be depopulated, those type of things. Um, composting could be a solution for that type of event. Um, and we know what the process looks like, but as far as um, where the product goes, testing that type of thing, we're going to have to get more involved with our Department of Food and Ag on that front. So what we are really um, doing is focusing on small farm composting where producers are losing, you know, one to 10 head a year. Um, and we're starting to move into kind of commercial facilities and that's where we have to move through the legislative process. And so um, I have a, I have a hope that later on those commercial facilities can actually be sites to kind of handle mass death loss, le death loss events. Um, the other thing that we're struggling with as well is um, getting the process the same across counties. So for example, our pathogen reduction period looks very different in Butte County compared to what it looks at in Siskiyou County, like super different. Um, and so that those are going to be some discussions that we have in our upcoming work uh, workshop with the regulatory agencies. So I think there's definitely a solution there, but um, it's it's definitely going to take relationship and kind of um, a hashing out of the science to make those two things work. Great. Thank you. Um, and real quick, uh, Linda is going to wrap us up here. I just wanted to note in the chat box there, there is a survey for this webinar. We would greatly appreciate feedback as we move forward with more events like this in the future any kind of uh, feedback you could provide would be great. Um, but, you know, Linda, I know you and I have, have spoke at, at length on your program and some early considerations. And um, I, I think you have some kind of uh, key components there in terms of, you know, availability, openness, site location, and, and things like that. So if you wanted to kind of mention to that, I know there was a few questions uh, related to kind of the how-to starting points timelines. So. Well, if you're going to start one, be patient with yourself and everyone else. It takes time to change people's perceptions. And tours are awesome once you finally get your site established. Um, also, having those tests, we have uh, tests sent over to Moses Lake 
once a year. It could be done oftener, but we just want to know where are the compost that's composted there a year, where it's at. And then if it's not finished, we know we, we need to just keep stirring it, add some more moisture to it and keep it in the process, heat it back up. And we found out that in Southwest Montana here, I'm assuming that it's because we didn't keep enough moisture on our piles. Um, they'd heat up, but they wouldn't stay hot long enough to break down some of the organisms we wanted. So it's not like we lost anything. We just repiled it and then tested it again this year. And it's great. And they, we haven't had any go off site yet. We have uh, people that are looking at putting it on some windbreaks they want to establish. Um, but the main thing is, I would say that Steve and I have learned that um, it figure it's going to take three times longer than what you think it should. It's just a very frustrating process. Even when you find the perfect site, the public can decide they don't want it there. Um, our county commissioners were all in favor of it but they went back as publicly. But I would say three, four years down the, the road, we've proven ourselves and they're not as nervous about it now, but we work hard at it at both sites and both sites are completely different. Mine's a little bit under two acres because I wanted lots of room to build those extra bunkers for wildlife purposes. So I don't have them coming in, but now we're going to be uh, composting some organic bison manure, which we will use to compost and sell to help run our site. So keep thinking there's no such thing as a box, just keep thinking creatively. And we're all good resources, hopefully. If anyone has questions, don't hesitate. Yeah, uh, excellent. And I, I just wanna say on, on behalf of myself, MSU Extension, Western Landowners Alliance, like, thanks. To all our panelists and NRCS, Kyle, and then obviously, you know, the panelists, Chris, Seth, Steve, Casey, Linda, this has been amazing discussion. Y'all have been amazing to work with. Y'all are superpowers answering questions on the fly in, in Q&A. And um, to the panelists that are still with us uh, there as we wrap this series up, thank you for, for joining us. Please don't hesitate if you have other questions send them in, we will get them to our panelists to, to make sure that, that they are answered. Uh, but otherwise, I, you know, Alex, if you have anything you wanted to say there at the end, but otherwise it's just a, a huge thank you for, for everyone's participation and time. And thanks again to NRCS for funding this work. We really appreciate the partnership and look forward to continuing to work with you. Yeah, and, and with that, enjoy the rest of your day. And, and again, thanks everyone for, for your time and participation. And there is that survey there that would be helpful feedback. So with that, thank y'all. Thank you.